We will finish Judges chapter 5, the song of Deborah, and begin chapter 6 today. And I'm going to warn you ahead of time, we're going to be spending about as long in chapter 6 as we have with the song of Deborah in chapter 5. Um, now, last week we looked at verses 12 through 22 of chapter 5, and that's centered on what I call the roll call of the tribes. And sadly, we saw that six and a half of the tribes refused to answer the Lord's call to arms in order to liberate the northern tribes of Israel from Canaanite oppression and to restart the march towards a proper establishment of a kingdom of God in the promised land. The Transjordanian tribes, in other words, those that were on the east side of the Jordan River, tribes of Manasseh, called Makir in this episode of, of Judges, and then Reuben and Gad, and Gad is called Gilead, all right, here, along with Asher, Dan, Judah, and Simeon, for various reasons, didn't want to get involved with this renewed holy war. Their reasons range from simple passivity to a lack of commitment to historical promises, to outright selfish, selfishness, and just a larger desire to maintain profitable relationships with pagans than to help protect their own brethren and to be obedient to God. Now, we ended up with a summation of the war in verses 19 through 22 that has a supernaturally ordered thunderstorm cause a flash flood of the normally semi-dry Kishon River, thus swinging the battle led by Barak in favor of the Israelites as the river's banks overflowed and inundated the battlefield. So this immobilized the main armament of the Canaanite forces, iron chariots. Because now they were trying to operate in a sea of mud. That doesn't work very well. Let's read a little bit more of this song. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 23. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's on page 276. Judges chapter 5, starting at verse 23, and we're just going to read through verse 27. Curse Meroz, said the angel of Adonai, Curse the people living there with a bitter punishment for not coming to help Adonai, to help Adonai against the mighty warriors. Yael will be blessed more than all women. The wife of Hever the Cani will be blessed more than any woman in the tent. He asked for water, she gave him milk. In an elegant bowl, she brought him curds. Then she took a tent peg in her left hand, a workman's hammer in her right, and with the hammer, she struck Sisera and pierced his skull. Yes, she shattered and crushed his temple. He sank down at her feet. He fell and lay there. He sank at her feet. He fell. Where he sank down, there he fell dead. Now, the 23rd verse of this song, again faces this with a couple of interesting challenges. Who or what is morose? And who or what is being referred to here as the angel of the Lord? It's interesting that at about this point in the book of the Judges, we're going to see the angel of the Lord front and center quite a bit. There is no other mention of Meroz in Scripture. But the general consensus is that it must be an Israelite town or a village that failed to do its duty. The level of anger expressed against this town indicates they must have had every reason to join this fight, but they wouldn't do it. Perhaps they had too, much, too many uh, political alliances with some of the Canaanite kings, or, or they were just too self-absorbed to care very much about their brethren or even God's commandment to serve him 
in this capacity. What's more challenging, though, is that this curse of morose is said to come from the angel of the Lord. Now, we've discussed the concept of the angel of the Lord before, so we're not going to delve too deeply in it today, but we'll look at it a little more in the next couple of weeks. However, I will summarize it. The Hebrew that is translated as angel of the Lord is Malach Yehoveh. Malach Yehoveh. Now, Malach does not literally mean angel. It's a generic word, and it just means messenger. Now, Yehoveh is, of course, God's formal name. A Malach can be anyone who brings a message. In fact, it doesn't even have to involve a divine message. Often in the Bible, a malach is merely a human being going about a strictly human task. However, when the term is used in a supernatural context, when it's attached to the formal name of God, it usually has the sense of this being a special heavenly being or even a manifestation of God Himself. It is more the norm that we find this Malach Iove speaking in the first person. In other words, he's identifying himself as God or at the very least carrying God's authority. A typical Malach, a messenger, whether human or angelic, refutes all human attempts to worship him. A malach Yehoveh accepts worship. The rabbis and Christian commentators disagree about the messenger of the Lord in many cases. For whatever reason, the rabbis tend to view almost every instance of this Malach Yehove as, as just a human messenger. So we might commonly call that messenger a prophet. Because bringing a message from God, of course, is exactly what a prophet does. Now some rabbis say that this use in verse 23 of the angel of the Lord is actually referring to Deborah who it's already been established is a prophetess. Others say it's referring to Barak, which frankly defies any logic to my way of thinking. In other words, the statement that forms verse 23 is, according to most rabbis, either Deborah or Barak who's being quoted. I see it otherwise. Now, rabbis, you see, tend to put some Bible characters high up on a pedestal. The same way the Catholic Church anoints some of their own as saints. They are put on a higher spiritual plane, above normal human beings. And even has them at times having direct conversations with the Lord. For some reason, there is a tendency in Judaism to take what is in plain language, some mysterious account, it seems to be of a spiritual nature and to humanize it. Christians are about as equally as guilty as taking some very literal Bible passages and spiritualizing them so they mean something else entirely. Now since God as the divine and supreme warrior leader of Israel is woven so visibly into the song of Deborah it's hard not to take this mention of Malach Yehoveh as God speaking. First of all, it's a standalone statement. It comes immediately after a summation of the battle at the Kishon River, immediately before the praise that is heaped upon Yael, who is the woman who killed the Canaanite army general, Sisra. Second of all, we have a curse being issued. And even though six and a half of the other tribes failed to show up for this battle, only the town of Meroz is given this harsh rebuke. Now, unless this curse is only rhetorical, 
If this is Deborah speaking, we have her issuing the curse apparently by her own authority. When other prophets issue a curse, typically it is that they preface it with the words, the Lord says, then they pronounce the curse. So it makes this curse a pronouncement of God, not something out of the prophet's own righteous anger. Third, nowhere else in Judges can we make a case for a shofet, a judge, being given the lofty label as a messenger of Yehovah, an angel of the Lord. It simply doesn't fit. And fourth, I think it well fits with the metaphor used in verse 20 of the stars in heaven fighting against Caesarea. Deborah has spent much of her song giving all the glory and credit to God for fighting against the Canaanites on Israel's behalf. The most plausible explanation then is that this is a divine manifestation of God that we find actually in a number of places in the Old Testament. A manifestation that is called formally the angel of the Lord, a malach yehove. That's who is invariably is being spoken about in the first person here in, in, in um, this song. In verse 23. Now in verse 24, praise upon praise is heaped upon the brave wife of Hever the Canaanite. Now saying that Yael will be blessed more than all women, this is not a continuation of verse 23. It is not being uttered by the Malach Yehove, the angel of the Lord. Rather, it is an effusive adoration by Deborah upon this female assassin who came to Israel's aid, even though her own husband was allied with Yavin, king of Hatzor, the king over this general that she killed. That is, this statement is not a statement of divine fact that we need to take word for word. Yael is not being elevated by the Lord above all other women. It's just a Middle Eastern way of speaking. Kind of like when several years ago we heard Saddam Hussein warn that if the USA attacked Israel it would set off the mother of all wars. Anybody remember that? Okay, it's just a culturally based exaggeration. Further, it's key for us to recognize that Yael was a Gentile. She wasn't a, an Israelite. And as we can quickly forget that the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is Hebrew literature. It's based entirely around an Israelite culture. So we find many accounts of Gentiles operating on Israel's behalf. And when they do, praise and blessing is just heaped upon them. Yael went against the tide. She went, actually went against her own husband, against her own clan. She put herself and her family in jeopardy to help a people to which she had no familial or genealogical attachment. There's only one reason for her to do this. She knew that Yehovah was preeminent. He was the God above all gods. And that to not help his people, when the opportunity literally fell into her lap, that was more dangerous than standing by idly or even assisting his people's enemies. Now, while I <laughs> don't recommend murder, I do recommend adopting Yael's recognition that with God, there's no such thing as neutrality. You're either for him and his people or you're against them. Not acting on their behalf makes one guilty by association of siding with his enemies. 
The next few verses recount the story of Yael killing Sisera, as told in Judges chapter 4. In a nutshell, Sisera was running away from his defeat at the Kishon River, heading, try, at least trying to head back to his headquarters at the city of Hatzor. It was not by accident that he arrived at the tent encampment of the Kenites as he fled. He would have known exactly where they were. He didn't just accidentally kind of stumble across them. He intentionally went there for temporary refuge because Hever, the clan chief, created some kind of friendly alliance or relationship with the Canaanites. Yale knew who Sisera was, so she treated him with the utmost respect. She offered him some type of milk product that they liked, it was highly prized, presented it to him in a royal-sized bowl. And once he felt safe and he had his appetite satisfied and he was relaxing in Yael's tent, Yael grabbed a hardened wood tent peg and a large workman's hammer. And with a couple of swift blows, drove that through Sisera's head all the way into the earthen floor of that tent. Men, the moral of the story is get rid of those hammers and pegs. I mentioned in a couple of lessons earlier concerning this assassination. That's what it was. We need to be cautious on how we view it. Christians essentially tend to point out the deception, seduction, lying, and then cold-blooded murder that occurred here. And that we should essentially see this as barbaric and wrong. But we have to temper that with understanding this was a time of war. There is nothing scripturally that prohibits deception, ambush, spying, killing the enemy leadership at a time of war. That this was pretty gruesome. Um, pretty tough way to go. <laughs> It is merely indicative of the way war was fought and people were killed in, in, in biblical times. Uh, today, we have what we call standoff weapons. All right? We have a much cleaner, neater way to kill our enemies, such as bullets fired from long range, bombs dropped where the only eyewitnesses are the dead people. We, we've kind of sanitized this whole process of war. And when the American or Euro European viewing public gets an occasional glimpse of the actual horror of it on our TVs, it, we, we pull back in revulsion. And now we want to indict the military for just doing its job. Now, while we don't see God, per se, giving his direct approval to Yale's actions, neither is there any indication here that the Lord saw this as a negative or a bad thing that she did. Well, let's finish off this chapter now. Open your Bibles to Judges 5.28, which is page 277 of a complete Jewish Bible. We're going to go on to the end. Judges 5, starting at verse 28. Sisra's mother looks out her window, peering out through the lattice. She wonders, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why are his horses so slow to return? The wisest of her ladies answers her, and she repeats it to herself. Of course. Why, they're collecting and dividing the spoils. A girl, two girls for every warrior. For Sisra, booty of dyed clothing, a plunder of colorfully embroidered garments, two embroidered scarves for every soldier's neck. May all your enemies perish like this, Adonai. But may those who love him be like the sun going forth in its glory. Then the land had rest for 40 years. If there is any 
section in the Song of Deborah that is perhaps a little bit questionable in its character, for me, it's here. Because we have Deborah mocking the pain and anguish of Sisera's mother, who's home, anxiously waiting for him to return from battle. I mean, in kind of a, a dark poetry, Deborah sings of Sisera's mother looking expectantly out of her window, waiting for her victorious son to arrive, leading his men in a victory parade. Why, she wonders... Why, Caesar's mother wonders, why is this chariot taking so long to get home? Where's all the horses and their riders? I imagine that she, like Caesar, reckoned that the, that the battle-hardened Canaanite troops with their fearsome chariots were going to make short work of these, this lightly armed Israelite militia. Now, because she's the mother of this military general, she was part of the elite. She was an aristocrat. She had servants. She had ladies in waiting so to surround her. And when they see she's terribly concerned, her ladies in waiting attempted to cheer her up by saying the only possible answer is that Caesar's man captured so much booty, it's taking an especially long time to divide it all up. That's the problem. Now, where it says in our complete Jewish Bibles, a girl, two girls for every warrior. I'm sorry to say this is a very cleaned up version of the much more graphic and frank reality that it literally says. Because in Hebrew, the words are a womb, two wombs for every warrior. In that era, women were just part of the war booty. The Victoria, uh, victorious soldiers would use them as objects of sexual gratification, and it was quite typical for them to bring some girls home to be used as long-term sex slaves. The law of Moses prohibited the Israelite soldiers from ever behaving in such a degrading manner. Well, this song ends with two petitions addressed to Jehovah. The first is that God would have all of his, and consequently Israel's, enemies be destroyed as thoroughly as what happened at the Kishon River. And second, that for those who love God, that they would be seen, who love God, that he would be seen as glorious as the rays of the sun when it sets. Deborah prays for vindication and victory on behalf of Jehovah's followers, those who will set aside convenience and comfort and safety when called by the Lord to be his holy warriors. The final words are, are, are typical in the book of Judges each time that the story of a certain shofet, a certain judge, is finished. It always ends with, and the land had rest. In this case, after this tremendous victory of Barak over Sisera at the base of Mount Tabor, the tribes of Israel had peace for a full generation, 40 years. But let's be clear that the reason for the generation of peace wasn't so much the present lack of enemies as it was the backtracking of Israel from their idolatry and sin with this new determination of these Israelite tribes to once again be obedient to the will of Jehovah. I also want to be clear that the reference to the 40 years of rest in, this, in the land was in this case referring to the northern tribal areas because it was the northern part of Canaan and the tribes who live there that are the context for this story of, of, of Deborah and Barak. Let's move on to Judges chapter 6. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. That'll be page 277 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Judges chapter 6. Follow along with me, please. 
But the people of Israel did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. So Adonai handed them over to Midian for seven years. Midian exercised its power harshly against Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel hid themselves in mountains and caves and in other safe places. Now, one time after Israel's sowing season, Midian with Amalek and others from the east attacked them. And they set up camp by them and destroyed the produce of the country all the way to Gaza. They left nothing for people to live on, no sheep, no oxen, no donkeys. For they came up with their cattle and tents, and they came in as thick as locusts. Both they and their camels were beyond numbering, and they came into the land to destroy it. Israel became very discouraged because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out to Adonai. Now, when the people of Israel cried out to Adonai because of Midian, Adonai sent a prophet to the people of Israel who said to them, Adonai, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up from Egypt out of a life of slavery. I delivered you from the power of the Egyptians and from the power of all your oppressors. I drove them out ahead of you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Adonai, your God. You are not to be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in, their, in whose land you are living. But you paid no attention to what I said. Then the angel of Adonai, the angel of the Lord, came and sat under the pistachio tree in Ophrah that belonged to Yoash, the Avesri. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from Midian. The angel of Adonai appeared to him and said to him, You valiant hero, Adonai is with you. Uh, excuse me, sir, answered Gideon, but if Adonai is with us, why is all this happening to us? Where are all his miracles that our ancestors told us about when they said, didn't Adonai bring us up from Egypt? For now, Adonai has abandoned us. He's handed us over to Midian. And Adonai turned to him and said, go in the strength of yours and save Israel from the hands of Midian. Haven't I sent you? But Gideon answered him, forgive me, my Lord, but what am I to save Israel? My family's the poorest in Manasseh. I'm the youngest person in my father's house. And Adonai said to him, because I will be with you. You will strike down Midian as easily as if they were just one man. And Gideon replied, if indeed you favor me, would you mind giving me a sign that it's really you talking with me? Please, don't, don't leave until I go and return with a gift and a present and present it to you. And he replied, I'll wait till you get back. Gideon went in, he cooked a young goat, he made a matzah from a bushel of flour. He put the meat in a basket, the broth in a pot, brought them out to him under the pistachio tree and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the matzah and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. And then the angel of Adonai reached out with the stick he was holding and touched the meat and the matzot, and a fire shot up out of the rock, and it burned up the meat and the matzot. Then the angel of Adonai disappeared before his eyes. Gideon realized he was the angel of Adonai, and he said, Oh, no, my Lord, Adonai, because I've seen the angel of Adonai face to face. But Adonai reassured him, Shalom to you. Don't be afraid. You won't die. And then Gideon built an altar there to Adonai and called it Adonai Shalom. And to this very day, it remains an Ophrah of the Avi Hasri. That very night, Adonai said to him, take your father's bull and the other bull, the seven-year-old, and destroy the altar to Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the sacred pole next to it. Build a proper altar to Adonai, your God, <clears throat> on top of this strong point. Then take the second bull, offer it as a burnt offering, using the wood of the sacred pole you cut down. Gideon took ten of his servants and did what Adonai had told him to do. He didn't do it by day because he was afraid of the men in his father's household and those from the city, so he did it at night. And when the men of the city got up the next morning, there was the altar of ba Baal destroyed, the sacred pole cut down and the second bull, a burnt offering on this newly built altar. And they asked each other, 
Who could have done this? After investigating, they concluded that Gideon, the son of Joash, had done it. Bring out your son, the men of the city demanded of Joash, so that he may die, because he destroyed the altar of Baal and cut down the sacred pole next to it. But Joash said to him, said to all those crowding around him, you're defending Baal, are you? It's your job to save him? Anyone who defends Baal will be put to death before morning. If he's a god, let him defend himself. After all, somebody destroyed his altar. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was given the name Yerubbaal, let Baal defend. Because they said, let Baal defend himself against him, since he destroyed his altar. Now all Midian, Amalek, and the others from the east joined forces. And they crossed over the Jordan, and they set up camp at the Jezreel Valley. But the spirit of Adonai covered Gideon. And he sounded the call on the shofar, and Abiezer rallied behind him. He sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh. They too rallied behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali. They came up to join them. Gideon said to God, If you're going to save Israel through me, as you said you would, then here. I will lay a, wheel, a, a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, while the ground stays dry, I will be convinced that you will save Israel through me as you said you would. And it happened. He got up early in the morning and he pressed the fleece together and wrung dew out of it, a bowl full of water. But Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me because I'm asking one more thing. Let me make one more test, please. This time, let it be dry only on the fleece with dew all over the ground. And that is what God did that night. It was dry only on the fleece, even though it was dew all over the ground. <clears throat> Scholars tend to see the judgeship of, of Gideon as the beginning of the second half of the period called the Judges. Now, although it's only three short chapters ago, that we had recounted for us the story of Othniel, the first judge of Israel, about two centuries now have passed since that time, as we began Judges, as we began Judges chapter 6. Two centuries have gone by. Conditions in Israel changed pretty greatly over that amount of time, as they would anywhere. Various Canaanite kings have come and gone. Israelite territories have expanded and contracted. The priesthood of Israel was moving steadily towards irrelevance. Simeon, their absorption into the tribe of Judah, that was well underway. Dan was on the move north in the process of, of abandoning their God-given territory on the Mediterranean for a much easier life up near Lebanon and Syria. The two and a half Israelite tribes who had chosen a life on the east side of the Jordan River were slowly but surely disassociating themselves from the rest of their Hebrew brethren. All this had gone on. Again, two centuries. Gideon represents then the fifth cycle of rebellion, apostasy, oppression by a foreign nation as a divine punishment, then Israel crying out for salvation and deliverance, and God responding by sending them a deliverer, a Mashiach, a Messiah, who would then lead them to victory. Well, after defeating their oppressors, Israel would, for a short time, step back from their idolatry, worship only Jehovah with sincerity and fidelity, and then they would obey the Torah. But in no time, backsliding would again begin. The cycle would start all over again. Well, the damage had been done. Israel had allowed the Canaanites to remain and thrive all over the promised land. What were they supposed to do? Get rid of them. Drive them out. Without their even realizing it, Israel had embraced many of the philosophies, standard cultural practices of the Canaanites. 
So it was tempting, easy for the Israelites to compromise, to reintroduce those pagan ways back into their worship and their everyday lifestyles. You know, there's a saying in the South. I love it. I've always enjoyed it. And I think it is some of the better folk wisdom we all ought to remember. When you're up to your rear end in alligators, sometimes it's easy to forget the original idea was to drain the swamp. That was Israel's condition. God instructed Joshua to completely drain the swamp of, his, of Canaanites, and they set about doing it. The problem is that as they engaged the enemy and as time passed, they found several good reasons, they thought, to allow many of those alligators to remain, rather than staying true to the goal of their total eradication. The unintended consequence was that the remaining alligators gained confidence, and they thrived, and they became a bigger pest than before the Holy War process had ever begun under Joshua. Well, over the next three chapters, we're going to see the history of Gideon, and then later his family, fully discussed because the amazing acting out of God's grace and His holy righteousness and justice was so obviously on display all during this time. But also because it contains a rich treasure of instruction and warning for the church and for the reborn modern state of Israel. It seems as though no matter how many cycles of foolhardy efforts that Israel makes to attempt peace with the world or for the church to compromise God's truth so that we can fill vacant pews and, and starving church bank accounts with the sucre of seekers and those who want only a mirage of godliness to soothe the emptiness of their souls We'll just try again and again, charging that the earlier generations who failed did so because they just didn't try hard enough. Thus, every one of the four cycles of apostasy related to us in the book of Judges up to this point ends with the words, then the land had rest for, usually, 40 years. But the next cycle begins with the same words. But the people of Israel did what was evil in God's eyes. End of one cycle, beginning of another. Well, the cycle of Gideon was the same. The cycle of the people of God in modern times is running on parallel tracks. I hope we have eyes to see and ears to listen. Verse 1 begins with those ominous words that Israel had enjoyed Faithfulness to the Lord, the fruits of divine blessings that resulted, but soon they gave it all away so that they could do what was right in their own eyes. Yes, it definitely does not literally say that Israel did what was right in their own eyes. Rather, it says they did what was evil in God's. I say to you with full confidence, doing what is right in our own eyes is evil in God's eyes. Evil, you see, is always more deceptive than overt. Evil almost always looks beautiful before it turns ugly. Evil seems right in our humanness before all goes wrong. Are we to think in these cycles of the judges that the people of Israel awoke one morning and said, I've got a swell idea. Let's go offend God. That the leader of Israel, the leaders of Israel all got together and said, let's make a pact to be wicked. I guarantee you that they would have protested greatly 
if they were accused of sin and idolatry. They would have denied it. They would have been aroused to anger at such an indictment. And I can make that guarantee because we read of it. Not only here, but in the prophets. The prophets that God chose to warn his people were not anxious to deliver that message because they knew full well it would be rejected and they were going to suffer for their efforts. The leaders and the citizens at large were incredulous that someone would point a finger at them and say they were behaving as heathens before the Lord. Nevertheless, that is what Israel in the era of the judges did, and that is what's happening today. And because God never changes, the pattern never changes. And because the pattern never changes, the consequences never change. God turned Israel over to their enemies to be oppressed. In this case, the enemy was Midian. Yep, the same Midian where Moses fled from Egypt, found a wife, lived as a simple shepherd for 40 years, and then was summoned to the burning bush on a hilltop, and then collapsed at the sound of Jehovah's voice, an unbearable weight of his presence there. Midian was the name of a semi-nomadic tribe that shared a blood kinship with Israel, see? Because they were descended from Keturah, Abraham's concubine. Territories were named after the dominating tribe that lived there. By now, Midian had grown in size, and various clans that formed the tribe claimed territories, ranging from the northwestern part of the Arabian Peninsula to the border with Edom on the northernmost part of the Sinai. Now recall that in the story of Deborah, that the Gentile woman Yael, who pinned Caesar's skull to the tent floor with a hammer and a peg, she was part of the tribe of Midian. She was of the Kenite clan, a small breakaway clan of the Midianite tribe that had moved into the northern part of Canaan and that had formed a friendship with the king of Hatsor. Israel would suffer at the hand of Midian and several other foreigners for seven years before God acted. The oppression was unusually severe, so severe that many of the Hebrews took to living in caves, hiding up in the mountains of Canaan. Part of the problem was that, as it says in verse 3, the Midianites teamed up with the dreaded Amalekites and, in addition, some number of smaller unnamed hordes simply called the children of the east, and they all worked together. And it says they would descend like locusts upon several of the Israelite tribes at harvest time. Now, apparently, they really weren't interested in conquest just, conquest, just simply stealing Israel's food supply. Now, this is actually quite characteristics, quite, quite characteristic of nomads in ancient times, and, and really in modern times. And it's just often misunderstood. By definition, nomads have no interest in holding land. They merely wanted the fruit of the land. Nomads had no interest in empire. They only want to take what others toil to produce. Much of the reason that the Middle East and Eastern Asia continue today as backward so-called third nations is that, that even now they live the lifestyle of nomads, even though they're more settled. Islamic law is the law of nomads, a law of predators. As Jews began to return to their ancient homeland in the 1800s, they returned to a land primarily populated by Arab nomads. The land was deserts and, 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 and swamps because nomads have no, interesting, have no interest or understanding of farming, husbandry, producing goods and services, or building. 
the land was used up and then left for dead. Shepherds moved their flocks and herds from pasture to pasture on land they did not own. They stayed there until there was nothing left. And then they would wander on to another pasture that could be used. Marauding nomads plundered passing caravans, whether they were family or foreigners. Well, verse 4 begins the story of a particular time, apparently in the eighth year since the seasonal invasions had started, that finally led Israel to cry out for God's help. The nomads attacked starting in the north central part of Canaan and worked their way even to the south near Gaza. They came in countless numbers, we're told, and boldly set up tent camps as they determined to extract every last morsel of food that Israel had produced over the past agricultural season, and they did just that. When they left, there was no fruit, no grain, no animals, whether they be food animals or beasts of burden, nothing remained in Israel. It should be noted that it says these inv invaders came on camels. Camels became the weapons platform of the descendants of Ishmael, who mostly dwelled upon the desert sands, while the Canaanites and those nations coming from the direction of Mesopotamia, they preferred horses. Now, while not as formidable as chariots, camels were a fearsome weapon. Camels gave the Midianites the military advantage of a speedy, long-range fighting force of large animals that certainly must have struck fear into the hearts of Israel. That it took Israel seven straight years, seven years, of these human locusts descending upon them before they sought the Lord for his help ought to be kind of familiar to us. Not just because that was the general pattern as was seen in the era of the judges, but because to this very day, God's people, whether Jews or Gentile Christians, seem to seek God only after matters have become extreme and as a last resort. Israel was brought very low. They existed in the most primitive ways, cowering in fear and eating disgusting things to survive, living in crevices in the rocks for shelter. You know how often I have pleaded to fill up our prayer list with petitions to God. This is because for some reason, our evil inclinations continue to reign over us such that we see turning to God as something to do only when all of our human efforts have been exhausted. This must be one of the lessons that Jehovah was teaching Israel. That to obey Him at all times is the best course. But when we wander off or bad things happen to us, our first action, our best action ought to be to repent, confess, seek mercy, and lay it at his feet in prayer. I mean, man, Israel was in a bad way. Whatever the Midianites and Amalekites couldn't carry away with them, it says they just destroyed it all. Starvation was a distinct possibility for God's people. When Israel finally did call out to their God, he answered through an unnamed prophet. Because of the way the Bible is translated, we can miss the impact of God's response of love and mercy through his prophet. For it said, as it says in the original Hebrew, Yehovah the Elohim of Israel says, I brought you up from the land of, Is, uh, land of Egypt. See, sadly, this generation really didn't know God very well. God was acutely aware of this fact. God reminded them it was He, Jehovah. He was their God, not Baal. It was He 
It was Jehovah who brought them up out of Egypt, not some other God. It was Jehovah who redeemed them from slavery. It was Jehovah who dro drove the Canaanites out before Joshua. It was he who gave Israel the very land that's now under invasion. Once again, Israel's God would deliver them from a predicament of their own making. The people well understood that when a prophet was sent from God, that it was invariably a message of warning or rebuke. This one was no different. The Lord wanted his people to think long and hard about why they were being oppressed. That in fact, the Lord had promised this oppression and that it was actually he who caused it because he wanted them to understand that this oppression of Eastern nomads wasn't some kind of a test. It was a judgment against them for their idolatry, for their rebellion. It was repentance that the Lord wanted, accompanied by real change. Father God also threw in a bit of a zinger when he reminds them in verse 10 that he told his people in the past they were not to be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in the land that they were now living. Uh, let's end with examining that statement just for a moment. The Lord is saying that at the core of their problem is what? Fear. That's the problem. Fear. They were fearful of the gods of their enemies, so they capitulated to them. Israel, as with all the other known people of the ancient world, accepted as self-evident that it was the gods of any particular nation that provided that nation with whatever power it had. So it was the gods that they feared primarily and only the army of that people secondarily. Appease the gods and chances were that you'd be spared. That's what fear does. It causes us to compromise. Fear causes us to appease and when that, what that compromise amounted to was that Israel openly worshipped the gods in hopes that their enemies wouldn't be so harsh. Or that perhaps their enemies' gods did have power, and so they better be acknowledged. But in no way did Israel think they were abandoning Jehovah in favor of other gods. Rather, they were simply giving in to their fears and hedging their bets. You know, it's been a long time since fear has gripped the world as it has today at the rise of Islam. Secular nations, especially like all of Europe, have no hope other than in their government bodies. Since they have long ago abandoned the Lord, They've taken up the way of compromise, appeasement, to deal with potent enemies. Leaders scramble to find nice things to say about Islam. Prime ministers and presidents work hard to rationalize that Islam's actually a good religion of peace and love because they're so fearful of, the, of their violence. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. That all that's necessary is for them to show tolerance to Muslims, respect for Allah. Give them a little bit of what they claim to want, and everybody will be better for it. Many in the church, from the Archbishop of Canterbury to hundreds of denominational leaders, decided in our day that declaring Islam and their God is on par with the God of Israel that's the correct course of action. Some of the Jewish leadership of Israel has determined basically the same thing. This is because despite their denials, they're acting out of fear. I mean, fear is so much more than an emotion of fight or flight. 
Fear is a vehicle of Satan. Fear is designed to pull us away from the Lord. And in verse 10, the Lord is telling Israel that trust in him for those who love him is the antidote for fear. But they wouldn't believe him. And what we're reading is the result. We'll continue with Judges 6 next week. 